Um, so thank you all for coming. Dr. Michael Wolf is the Deputy President of CABA, the Global Education Network. He has had much of his career in the international context. He completed a PhD in American Studies and in International Education for many years and has written widely on international education and literary and cultural studies. He serves on a number of boards and was a member of the Board of Directors of the Forum on Education Abroad from 2006 to 2012. Yes. So thank you for being thank here. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. I was allowed out on parole from the Forum Board <laughs> tomorrow. Well, I, my title is sort of odd. I, I, was, I wanted to do a little bit of deconstruction, so I've called it Things We Should Be Talking About in International Education, From Aliens to Dorothy Gale. And this is, in every respect, a bizarre path. But I, what I'll try and do is really suggest some of the prevailing narratives that are not in our interests and suggest what we might al alternatively be talking about. And along that rocky route, I'm also going to demonstrate the that the assumption that age brings wisdom is fragile delusion. Age makes you grumpy, as you'll tell. <laughs> and so I've kind of evolved into, I think of myself as a kind of Jeremiah howling at the moon. But as a colleague, a more prosaic colleague recently said, actually, an annoying old curmudgeon, so you can decide. But let me begin with the context. I'm not only complaining because I've been in this field for a very long time, and we have significantly improved what we do. Now, students usually arrive in the country with some rough idea of where they are. They sometimes and often have insurance, and we try, you know, health and safety uh, mechanisms to keep them relatively well, and that is a great improvement on what it used to be. And they're often, I'm really interested in this group of students that we have, because they're very curious and engaged. And one of the myths that I don't like is this discussion of millennials, generation this and generation that. Because I think all teachers are subject to a thing I think of as the Eden syndrome. And that's the illusion that then, whenever then was, is better than now. We all think that. And Socrates said his current students were useless. You know, as you know, Joe, that isn't true. But it's also based, this idea of the millennials is based on a kind of stereotyping of a, an age and a group. Uh, what is, which is counter to what we try and teach, which is to undermine stereotypes, all right? But that said, not everything in the garden is rosy, and this is where I go into my Jeremiah role, because we burdened in this field several unhelpful metaphors that we use without thinking. I think we're over-reliant on the idea of cultural difference, and we're unresponsive to radical alterations in our environment. We become dependent as well on myths of transformation and conversion, which may be appropriate in a monastic community, but not necessarily outside. Our narrative has changed as well. And th I think this reflects shifting global ideologies. You know, the, I think the, the great ideological conflict in my lifetime and more recently, it's become, it's not anymore about the isms. It's not communism, capitalism, socialism so much, but it's between collectivism and all those manifestations and individualism. And see, that is the overarching kind of conflict that shaped the way we are now. And the idea of collective good in many contexts has diminished. And I'm not saying it's for good or ill, maybe it's inevitable. But you know, when I came into this field, William Fulbright's thinking, he actually interviewed me for my first job. That was his ideas were at the heart of our agenda, and he talked about the benefits of international education as the acquisition of empathy. That was one of his phrases. We've shifted though, because the narrative is now is focused around international education in terms of individual advantage, a way of getting a better job, having a personal experience, enhancing the resume, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. I'm not saying that's wrong. There are still dinosaurs like me, however, who have some nostalgia for that earlier narrative. The, we cling, in a way, to the idea that interaction between young people around the world can enhance international understanding. And that was the core of what Fulbright was trying to say. Right now, though, we describe a mechanism to increase the gap between the privileged, those who can participate in these opportunities, and the rest. You know, we talk about employability being enhanced, all that. 
So the prevailing rhetoric now is based on the assumption that student mobility, I think, offers a pathway into an advantaged elite. And international education, in a way, is constructed then as a way of diminishing distance, that it used to be constructed as a way of diminishing distance, and in a way now it's constructed in the reverse way of increasing the difference. But that's our reality. You know, collectivity, collectivism has given way to ide ide individualism, and our field is part of that process. You know, the idea of exchange is kind of central to this. When Fulbright and others talked about Jack Eagle, uh, my first boss in this field, talked about exchange, they were talking about interaction, facilitating interaction between students abroad and students at home, wherever those two places were. It's now, though, the term really describes a te technical arrangement. The mutuality of benefit has disappeared. In fact, host students have disappeared in the main from the narrative. Now, not exclusively. But I'm talking about a weight of um, rhetoric. So within those kind of broad contextual boundaries, I'll moan on for a bit longer and try and offer a swift overview of what we're talking about <coughs> and what we should be talking about. And I'm going to focus on these ideas. The word aliens, right? Then the lunar and lunacy, mysticism and the yellow brick road. These are obviously deeply logically connected. <laughs> I was telling my boss I was going to do this, and he said, you're doing what? And he just went away muttering in the direction of human resources, you know. Um, so let me first talk about the notion of aliens. We know abroad is a constructed space, right? It's an invention. We make it up in all sorts of different ways. The prevailing rhetoric of international education creates this as an alien environment. And I'll, I'll try and explain this a bit. Because we say we must teach students to negotiate difference. So we start with the conclusion. That which divides us inherently in that argument is more important than that which unites us. We have to study difference. And we construct that difference with a very vague and, and sometimes ill-conceived notion of culture. But we construct culture as a barrier, cross-culture, interculture. So we're already telling students, we're reaching the conclusion, because the assumptions then are that those differences are what we have to teach, and they're more important than any similarities, and that we can explain them through the mechanism of something we call cultural analysis. Seems to me that that's based firstly on a misconception of what we actually do, in study abroad, we take students from country to country. Countries are not synonymous in any way with cultures. You know, countries are formed by combinations of history, politics, myth, you know, poetry, war, colonialism, accident, intent in the case of the disunited kingdom where I come from, stupidity, and so on. So the role of culture in the formation of the uh, nation state is usually in incidental, sometimes irrelevant. You know, think of Africa. Those nations are not at all synonymous with the cultures. Think of Iraq, the Middle East as a whole. So I think we've built this agenda on weak foundations. And also the confusion of international, international with intercultural, I think is also inadvertently reactionary insofar it is prioritizing human division over human similarity. So I think it's based on a parochial rather than cosmopolitan view of the world. So what should we talk about? Right, I can tell you a bit what well, I think, you know. At Kappa, what we try and do is identify what we think are the things students really need to understand, the essential characteristics of contemporary reality. And we focus around the highly contested, complex, problematic notion of globalization. The fact that it's highly contested and all that is very good, means you can teach it. Right? And you can teach it in an interesting way. So we want students to recognize, analyze, describe the impacts of globalization, and therefore in, they're involved in urban environments. There's almost a direct line. This is the second of our learning objectives, is urban, urbanization. And urban environments are particularly interesting when you link them with globalization because they problematize the notion of abroad. Because abroad is not one place. You know, we've said it's, a, it's two places. We want students to engage with the locality, that which is out there in the streets, uh, you know, wherever we are, but also with 
the way in which that environment is expressive of various kinds of global reality. So you're almost in a paradoxical position. You want them to look narrow and large. So that's what we're trying to do. Instead of that rather amorphous cultural um, debate, but moving on from that to even more bizarre things, I now want to talk about the lunar and lunacy. Now, I think we've, we're burdened. So it goes all over the place. This, you know, it may, will make no sense by the end. If you think it's confusing now, wait, it gets worse. We have a lot of inappropriate metaphors, I think. Industry and business give us some poor metaphors. We, we reply, we've embraced terms like return on investment, inputs, outputs, mechanistic filters, that devalue, I think, distort, if not devalue, complex learning processes. And we try and then assess that learning because we want to prove that we're actually rather serious fellows and that our outcomes reflect the reality we just invented. And in some contexts, this is leading us to seek to ass assess things beyond reason. I think we'd do better to recognize an important distinction in my head. That's learning, the distinction between learning outcomes and outcomes of learning. These seem to me different things. Later, I'll talk about the yellow brick road. And what Dorothy, everybody has read The Wizard of Oz, right? I mean, otherwise, this whole thing now is completely done. Uh, what Dorothy learns on the yellow brick road is driven by two things. Her learning outcome is what she thinks she's going to get from the wizard, who turns out to be a jerk. Right? What she actually learns are messy outcomes on the yellow brick road, outcomes of learning, not learning outcomes. But I also want to consider the notion of the lunar and the notion of re-entry, which has irritated me for years. Re-entry from the moon. Right? It's a metaphor that's drawn from NASA, right? You know, in the old days, they used to say, the eagles landed or whatever, light cigarettes, they phew. So it's dramatic, it's stressful, and it's potentially dangerous, as NASA reminds us. We have splashdown and all that. It's literally fraught, and which in terms of lunar exploration is fully understandable and appropriate. To me, the problem arises when we use that metaphor to describe students returning from a period overseas. And most students have not been to the moon. They've been to rather desirable and enjoyable places. So the notion of re-entry, by using that, we're creating expectations of danger and difficulty. So we, what do we do, therefore? We say, oh, this is difficult. We create mechanisms to support students to overcome the implicit and anticipated trauma. We also frequently told, and I love this thing, students suffer trauma because their peers are not interested in hearing about their studies abroad. Now, learning that most people are mostly indifferent to your narratives is a useful life lesson, <laughs> right? It demonstrates that despite everything we have been told, we are only at the center of our own universe. So what should we be talking about then? I like the idea of homecoming much more. The, the idea of homecoming is celebratory, affirm, affirmative. It doesn't create an expectation of trauma. And it's more appropriate and more likely, I think, to lead to positive outcomes. So if you use homecoming as well, you can also turn it into some educational opportunity for students to exchange their stories and to validate the learning that we say we have given them. It stresses the affirmation rather than neurotic consequences. So that's, I think we should be talking about that. And now to mysticism, right? Things we are saying that are mystic. I got into real trouble for this stuff. You know, I wrote about this, and I, several people... Michael Page has never spoken to me. <laughs> but we, we are addicted to notions of transformation in our field, and we get very teary-eyed when students tell us that study abroad changed my life. I've been thinking about this concept for years now. I think that statement is profoundly problematic, not for what it says about the, the student who says it, because it's well-intended, well, uh, but for what it implies. And for me, the first biggest problem is in the passive voice. The study about changed my life. It suggests a process of magical transformation in a mythical space called abroad, which really obscures the fact that to gain anything, to learn anything from any form of study, the participant needs to be an active researcher, not a vessel into which experience is poured. This is a glimpse into my own autobiography. Let me tell you, it is perfectly possible 
to learn nothing from being in a foreign environment. I've done it many times. Now change it around and put it in the active voice, you change the whole meaning. I changed my life by studying abroad. The whole thing is altered. The responsibility belongs to the learner and it's not a consequence of location alone. The other trouble, there's lots of troubles here, <laughs> is that the statement creates a mythical, single, undifferentiated space called abroad, right? Wherein the participant will again will gain insight through proximity. And it, we, proximity does not guarantee intimacy, right? But he raises the question, is everywhere abroad, wherever that place is, more likely to be transformative than where I live? Seems to me really disrespectful of home society, actually, of American culture. Just said culture, doesn't it? American society, norms, values, which does not, by implication, have the same power to alter life experience. And this is simply not true. And wherever you go, you take yourself with you. A location of itself is not transformative. You know, you can try and change your life in Paris, Timbuktu, or St. Joseph's, right? You can screw it up in those places as well. The third, or 3.A, where I organised, um, um, the other thing it does is create an unrealistic expectation against which many international educational experiences may fail against that standard. So, change my life. Compare that with I learned some Spanish. Seems to me I learned some Spanish a perfectly admirable achievement, but it's pretty small scale compared to it changed my life. So the rhetoric creates inflated environment. There's another thing we keep going on about. Kappa, we don't. Um, and that's the concept of the global citizen. You know, if we are lucky, we are citizens of a country. Many people aren't, right? I spent the summer researching the romance. I can tell you about that. The globe is a very fractured, metaphorically fractured and divided place. It has no citizens. I know the metaphor, but the metaphor's a mistake, I think, because if we tell students that we're going to turn them into global citizens, we embed failure. Better, we should say, that the goal is to, cre to create better educated citizens, to teach students something about another nation so they can be better citizens of their own. You know, a global citizen is an absolute condition, right? You either are or are not. All citizens are. And that seems to me counter to the language of education, which needs to be subject to qualification. Less or more. Education is not about an absolute value. You, you acquire progressively things. You learn them more or less effectively. So were we to use terms, I particularly like, I know the problems with it, cosmopolitanism, internationally aware. They're progressive. It's possible to be more or less cosmopolitan, more or less uh, internationally aware. And it's a learned process. It's con in the context of education, it makes sense. It's not an envisaged state of grace. You know, imagining the blessed condition of global citizenship is a matter of ideological or religious faith, I think. It's an act of mystic conversion. You become it. You don't grow into it. You can't be a bit of a citizen, right? And that seems to me that's the business of the priests rather than professors. And I reckon it does us a significant disservice to speak in the language of prophets unless the goal is indeed to become a prophet, and I don't recommend it to you. For most of us, our goals are you know, more limited, advisably. We aim to move students from relative ignorance towards relative understanding. None of this is intended by people who say these things. You know, both of those things usually are said by very well-intended people. But they're examples of things I think we should not be talking about. They're quasi-inspirational flourishes that create unrealistic aspirations and murky distortions. And now hides the real seriousness of what we're actually trying to do in international ed. So what should we be talking about? I like to talk more about objectives than outcomes, by the way. Because objectives recognises the potential to fail, right? You know, an outcome, you kind of, that's going to happen. An objective is, you know, inshallah, it might happen. Outcome implies predictability. An objective is aspirational, I guess. So we're going to undermine, we have undermined, I believe, the academic validity of our endeavours, unfortunately, because of the rhetoric, not because of what we do. So we shouldn't be 
framing our aspirations in terms of transforming lives. Those li though lives may be transformed, that's not the object. It might be a consequence, a happy consequence. Baptism is transformational, as is transubstantiation. But that, as I said, that's the territory of prophets, priests, occasionally madmen. In more mundane terms, you know, any experience can have the potential to be transformative, right? Love, backache, mostly. Wealth, poverty, drugs, above all, death is transformative, right? But our objectives as educationalists, I believe, need to be described in educational terms that are specific and cumulative. Less to more, hopefully. Realistic, I like high impact, I don't mean that. Formative, certainly not transformative. So at this point, we are led inexorably and inevitably towards the yellow brick road. This was an inevitable progression. Now I have to tell you, there are not many... Has anybody in this room read all 14 volumes of Frank Baum's? Well, thank God, I'm going to get away with what I'm going to say now. It's always a worry that I'm kidding. You. But I have. I read all of 14 volumes. He wrote 14 books about Oz, did Frank Baum. Not many people would admit to having read them all. Uh, because it's also a sign of a kind of mental decay, but never mind. But looking at them, what Dorothy did is really instructive to us. Now, she is not a traditional study abroad student, right? She didn't do any pre-departure orientation. She's not worried about transfer of credit. But she's a kid from Kansas. Not entirely different from students we see at Kappa. And she possesses the gift of curiosity. Baum, one, one of the places, calls it wandering eyes, which is a wonderful phrase. And she learns a lot. Now, you have to take my word for it, because I'm the only one in the room who's read all this. Um, but she learns about power and politics, and that's a crucial thing. She encounters political discord, ethnic division, diversity, all those interesting things. She learns to be a cosmopolitan, in so far that she understands that similarities matter more than differences. She learns that we're not defined or constrained by difference. Empathy can transcend those barriers, right? She simultaneously learns a really important lesson, I think, and we can talk about this, is to discriminate, not tolerate. I can say more about this. I think nuanced perspectives require moral choices. She learns independence, courage, all these things that our students hopefully earn. And she, understand, and she learns that understanding the world is not simple or easy. And the journeys offer, offer us a kind of ideal metaphor, I think, for liberal international education. Because the point of arrival may be less significant than the path towards that arrival, right? The processes may, in other words, be important, more important than outcomes. And she learns also that there are worthwhile values at home. Oh, it's so nice to be back in Kansas, she says at one point. Believes it, which is really weird. So she hasn't, doesn't go through anguished re-entry, you know, but she celebrates return several times. Now, she's atypical of our students. Oz and its environment is a non-traditional location. You do not find it very often on the study of the map. But the, the, the protagonists and the environment are somewhat familiar. You know, the Oz is a profoundly diverse environment, as was saying, and it's menaced by fanfasms. In, uh, which is Baum's version of North Koreans, you know, in, in the Emerald City, a book you haven't read. Um, and their chief joy is to destroy happiness. So they're like that, you know. That. Now, I'm really tempted to summarize all 14 novels for you. But I'm assuming <laughs> I would find it entertaining that this would make this evening hideously prolonged. So I don't want to, you know, test the patience even by the good folks of St. Ben's and St. John's. So I'm going to just pick up one or two tiny things from, and move towards a conclusion. Dorothy learns one thing that I think we really focus, we want our students to understand and ask. The question is, who has the power? Who controls political realities? That's the key thing to understand. It's a lot more important than the stuff we tell them about the British, you know, how close the British speak to each other. All that stuff is stereotypical anyway and not true anymore. She learns that that's a complex and difficult question. So I think her experience teaches us that educational notions based around those kind of constructs uh, of culture are insufficient. 
No, you, you could ask. Our learning object is based on cultural difference. The most important thing to understand, for example, about South Africa, where you have a program, or Ghana, where we have a program, let alone ours. That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. <laughs> Do we understand the significance of apartheid or the multitude of evil in Oz represented by the Fan Fathoms through cultural analysis. Really, we need a political analysis. That's what you need, a historical, political analysis, sometimes with religious uh, overtones, because many of these things uh, come together. So I think the degree of which we have rooted myopically in that discourse hasn't helped us. Questions, really important questions of religious difference Inequality, social injustice, nationalism, tribalism, conflict are muted in education abroad discourse because culture is less disturbing and challenging than, for example, talking about the politics of um, global injustice. So we've given ourselves a kind of anodyne area of speech. It enables us to avoid areas of investigation of religious differences. You know, I'm just editing a, a, an edition of Frontiers about religion and study abroad. It avoids us really dealing with that which has disrupted and challenged our lives. I think it's reductive and constraining. And it's frequently shaped around national stereotypes. I've been to so many lectures where you say Italians are, the English tend to, Australians like, and so on, ad nauseas. And that's really projecting a, a stereotypical thing. The other thing I think we have to think about is that in the ethics of cosmopolitanism or international, internationalism, there is the idea that certain values are universal and they're sh not shaped, modified, or defined by relative cultural practices. I know cultural relativism is strong in our field, but I really disagree with it. Because the fact that something may be described as cultural doesn't put it beyond ethical judgment. We have many examples of this. That's not to suggest, I'm not suggesting we could, should inculcate specific moral standards in students, but rather acknowledge that students are also entitled to make judgments based, we hope, on thoughtful discrimination, not prejudice. That's our job to teach them that. They're participants too, I think, in the rights and responsibilities of what it means to be an ethical human. So why would we take that away from them? So I think we should do what, we should teach students to learn what Dorothy learned. I'm going to stop talking about Dorothy in a minute. It's complete nonsense. Which is not to tolerate, but better to discriminate between things. To recognize the difference between the smart and the stupid, the crass, the clever, the moral, amoral, immoral, the real and the unreal, increasingly important things to learn. So instead of promoting the notion of tolerance, I think it'd be better to consider how students may be empowered to make their own intelligent and informed acts of discrimination based on their own beliefs. So I think this, I'm going to just say a little bit more about Dorothy and assessment, because it creates a messy thing, you know. Because Dorothy's journeys are always dangerous. They're rarely direct, they're usually challenging. And they lead her to a thing that Baum calls wisdom. Not a word we hear enough in the context of education. And that offers, I think, a corrective to the utilitarian focus in education abroad. In The Road to Oz, there's, there's a character called the Shaggy Man, and he teaches Dorothy that the path is first and foremost the objective, not the end of it. And he says, each of the roads must lead somewhere or it wouldn't be here. If we travel long enough, my dear, we will come to some place or another in the end. What place it will be, we can't even guess at the moment, but we're sure to find out when we get there. Now that's a metaphor for liberal learning, I think, and it conflicts with our current preoccupation with the assessment of learning objectives. Why do we have this? I understand exactly why we are forced into this position. You know, the, a combination of our own infl inflated uh, rhetoric, that mentioned the promotional gush we all use, alliterative spittle, which is the core of uh, marketing, right? This has eroded our credibility. So the outcomes, the proliferation of outcomes assessments, I think on the one hand is internal, generated by us, compensatory gestures to prove that, we're not that we are serious fellows not running holiday camps or indulging in 
vacuous pleasantries. Now, there's nothing wrong in assessing what students learn. I'm not going. We've done it for years. You know, we call them essays, examinations. Classic methods of, I'm not, I'm not saying they were great, but they are methods of assessing what has been learned. However, in education abroad, we want to extend that. We seem to want to extend that in a much greater way, but also in a much less focused way. We try, we are charged sometimes with assessing what students learn from the totality of their education abroad ex experience. So it will include the collective impact of the courses, the learning that may or may not occur through engagement with the environments, insights gained by exposure, accidental learning, all the rest of it. You must invite it to look into the soul and assess, and it may be a bit too far. The other thing is that those outcomes, as I've said really, are less predictable and not easily discernible. So I would love to see us focus more on process, the quality of process. Now I understand the other reason why we feel the need to have measurable outcomes, and that's we use significant resources and we have to account for what we did. You know, and there is a utilitarian uh, imperative. But I think the problem for me is that we haven't defended our position well enough in liberal higher education. We've framed our justification in terms that have been given to us, not terms that gen educationalists might generate. And I'm not saying you can't combine the two. I mean, you can. We've focused on that which may be quantified and ignored the question of wisdom and how do you measure wisdom, right? So what does Dorothy learn? She learns that Kansas is not the world. That's not a bad thing to get. That compassion, courage, intelligence are found in many, many surprising places, expressed in many diverse and complex ways. You know, from the Tin Man, right? She, he was in the film, right? Uh, she learns that capacity for compassion is not expressed in false expressions of devotion, right? Exactly the lesson learned much more painfully by King Lear, well, well, I am. So I, do, I don't only read Baum, I do read some other stuff. You know, and she, from the cowardly lion, she learns that bravery is more than bluster or bravado. From the scarecrow, scarecrow, that capacity for reason may be developed and expressed in many ways. These are important um, lessons. And she resists the temptation to act as if abroad, wherever it is, is somehow or another necessarily richer than home. As we said, wherever you go, you take yourself with you. That's a noisy neighbour often. And it's the self that's the primary participant in any drama of transformation, not the scenery. We all know this in instinctively. Seems to me these are ultimately profound collective learning experience. Now, if Dorothy can learn this on a short term, travelling, study abroad experience, hardly worthy of any credit at all, how much more might we be able to teach our students? Now I know Dorothy's story is not commonplace or representative, but it creates some useful pointers about intentional learning experiences that are not dependent on crass distortions. So my last thought. I want to frame my conclusion as lamentation upon the housetops of Moab. I want to go back to that Jeremiah thing. It's the right place, right? Yeah. I believe that the single big, biggest issue that confronts international education is the question of parity of esteem with other academic endeavours. And that making the case for what we do is critical to the future of what we do. So to move in that direction, to make that case, which I think is easily made if you look at it properly, we're going to need to discard certain things. Myths of transformation and conversion that we've embedded in our uh, environments, in our local and global reality. We need to stress the strength of situational learning, which is a whole other thing. The impact of topic and space and ideology and time, which is not something that customarily is offered in universities domestically, anywhere in the world. So we're going to have to, I think, review our agenda, change the things we do to some degree, but more often, but more importantly actually, change the way we talk about the things we do. Because we don't do ourselves justice often. So I get, you know, when I circle back, this is a kind of Jeremiah approach, I suppose, like howling at the moon with the authors of the Old Testament, you know. So I love this phrase, there shall be lamentation 
generally upon all the house tops of Moab. Doesn't mean a thing to me, but I like the rhetoric, right? So to extend this kind of biblical cons- preoccupation and end here, it seems appropriate in St. John's and St. Mary's to do this, there are concepts like the boils of Job that have afflicted us. And I'll stop there and you can start abusing me and telling me I was wrong. And, you know. So there are questions, comments, disagreements. Sure, you know, but, um, we invest a lot here in faculty-led programs. And given what you said about sort of reframing some of the questions we're asking and how we're approaching the work that we do, um, in, in all your years of experience, what do you think is critical to a successful director, mentor, teacher, um, and how can we help our faculty be ready for that? Really good question. It's a great question. Um, I think some level of humility, you know, understanding that they are the expert in that area, in that academic subject, but that they need support. And I mean, it, that's, it seems a simple thing to say, but I think these days with health and safety and all the other things, it's important to have cooperators who are inputting into the program, both I think intellectually and, in, and practically. Um, and asking faculty, I was a faculty member, so asking a faculty member to, to express a certain level of humility is not the easiest thing to do in the world. Um, but if you, can le- you know, if you can open up that notion to the idea that your international colleagues are important to the success of this activity, then it's good. And you know, good teachers are also learners, right? You know, the worst teachers are the ones who know everything. But I imagine you do a really good job with that job, don't you? I mean, how do you teach your teachers? Do they listen to you? Not a company thing. Some do. Some do. People approach it like with what you said with humility and with an understanding that there are things that they can still. Like. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a transaction between people on the ground. We do a lot of managing faculty-led programs and you know it's, a, it's really a transaction and sometimes it's very, it doesn't always work right uh, but it is a transaction between the people and the students the, the, the faculty the students and the local expertise um, <coughs> just thinking about the one of the things that struck me at the beginning was your that their students are no less capable than they ever were it just strikes a, a true core for me. Um, my only real problem with what you said is that our students, for the most part, don't know the metaphors that we use that you want us to change. And so in a way, that should be easier to change. But in another way, um, it's hard to know where to start with them. Um, obviously, the group is within the group. They're all over the place yeah. in range of uh, experiences and ability to interpret experiences. But it feels hard for me to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, I don't know how to answer. You know, one of the things we try and do is have students form lead questions. You know, what is it they want to learn? And then, at, towards the end of whatever experience, you know, to say, well, were they the right questions? And if not, what were the right questions? I did I learn them? So to focus on a point of inquiry, you know, that's why I like that phrase, one wondering eyes and bounds, you know. Um, to encourage them to be curious, because they mostly are curious. I mean, when you think about it, the students who go abroad are sort of an elite. You know, going, going back to that, they are self-selected, curious people. Um, and they may even be an economic elite, that's another question. So they, they start with good intentions. They don't start with the idea of being dumb. You know? um, and we found there are certain things we need to teach them, actually. So we've changed our curriculum over the last 10 years, and I was brought in to do that, you know, to focus on notions like globalization, uh, urbanization, and all those things. 
And it's, but I think it's particularly important for a lot of our students who actually have never been in a city before to understand how this thing happened, you know? And then the implications of that, like diversity, to, to teach students that or demonstrate, if you can, that diversity is not the same thing everywhere as it is here. You know, students bring a kind of default distinction uh, uh, based on race. You are not going to understand Ireland in those terms, or Florence, or even London, actually. You know, the, I'm not saying there's a better places. I'm not saying we haven't got our problems in all these parts of Europe. But the race is not the defining distinction. It may be part of it. You know, and, and so I, I think you can demonstrate as much as you can, and, and you can. To some degree, we worry a lot about are we changing their souls? And I think that's their business. The kind of the metaphor that occurs to me is you go to a restaurant, you order the meal, right? You eat the meal. The, the chef doesn't want to digest it for you. That's kind of your business. You know, it's over to you now. But we use lots of props. I have a prop I use when I talk to students. I'm really allowed to talk to students because they say I confuse them and upset them. Oh, no, this isn't it, but it could be it. I have a guy in, in Florence, I buy hideously cheap ties uh, off a Somali chap who's got a stall in the Duomo. And I like them, and I like him, and I had him speak to our students, actually. And I said to him once, look, they're like three for five euros. Okay. But they've got made in Italy on the back. And I said, come off it. He said, no, no, they're made by a Chinese guy around the back. Perfect example of globalization. Somali guy, Chinese guy making ties for an Englishman in the Duomo, by the Duomo. So I think sometimes if we can demonstrate to students this stuff, get them to look at it, observe, analyze, you know, that transaction, explore and analyze. Would, why does it bother you that you can't control that? Or what, what did you want? No, um, I have no control. <laughs> that, that's kind of a myth, too. Um, I really want to serve the students. I really want them to have both the communal adventure and the individual um, adventure. Uh, and, and, um, and I want to be able to facilitate that. And the programs here start out in a beautiful way where the director works through three or four several hour meetings with the group to, to establish norms, to figure out you know, the personal culture, where are we coming from, if we're going to something else. Yeah. And I really like all of that. But much of it does fit in to the metaphors you were talking about. Yeah. Um, that says, okay, now you're going to go off and have this transformative and I do believe they're going to, but I don't think I should be telling them that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I just found the talk engaging. Okay. But I think the point you make is really important about the group. You know, this is one of the reasons... I mean, I have, no, I have great respect for all the work that colleagues do in this field, I really do. And, uh, but the direct enrollment models of students going into universities has it serious limitations when you think about some of these things, because you cannot control curriculum. You're not dealing with these issues that address the fact that these are American students abroad. And it seems to me one of the real learning things that students have, they take back, maybe it takes a year or two, is they may learn a bit about Britain or China or wherever they are, but they learn a lot about what it is to be an American. You know, and that act of discovery is a communal one, I think. The, uh, who, who was it? Malcolm Cowley uh, in the, wrote a book about expatriates in the 30s in, in Europe. And he has one remark, and this is not a direct quote, it's a, a paraphrase. He said, we had come 3,000 miles to discover America. And I think our students do that. You know, they, get, they don't always want to talk about it because it's embarrassing to them sometimes or it's difficult. But they go back and process that, and that's a really interesting lesson. It's what we all learn when we go abroad, right? You know, if you're British, you get it in the neck everywhere. You know, you learn about colonial exploitation, all the things we did, you know, 
but you apologize the whole time. Say, so, sorry, I'm sorry, I wasn't there, it wasn't with me, you know, you know. my fault. <laughs> Slumped into inertia now. I don't blame you. Well, if no one else has a question, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. I was going to say, by the way, one of the things we do is an advert so much is we publish uh, an annual um, occasional paper. How can it be a, a, an annual occasional paper? <laughs> I don't know. I think that one for. I brought a couple of samples from the last two, one on civil rights, one on human rights, and we also have a symposium and a call for... But so if you want to look at any of that and take it with you... Uh, and we, do, we publish something at the University of Minnesota on employability. So it is an advert, but it's also because I don't want to take those books back anyway. <laughs>